Hello and welcome back to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information, it is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, I don't like melodrama. No, yeah, I do not like it at all. I'm going to mention it 20 more times throughout this entire episode. <laughs> I don't like melodrama <laughs> stop being so melodramatic cam <laughs> enough stop it Ugh. anyway speaking of melodrama the question we have and I-, I should say every single time we do a film like this i like to say we one up ourselves in-, in terms of going down the rabbit hole of finding films that uh have been lost to time we may have stumbled upon potentially a bit of a gold mine in this one I think British Agent was a little more obscure than this, I think. Really? I think so, yeah. I think that had more pedigree behind it than this film does. I don't know about that. Uh, This is like... No, I think this one's pretty big stars in it. Wasn't the director quite like... like Quite noted well, director for it and stuff? Michael Curtiz, yeah. The, yeah, but the director of this one is pretty fascinating as well. So, okay. I, okay. I don't know. I, I would say... I don't think it's a real like horse race between the two. Uh, I think it's like <laughs> horse they're horse, both nice. Let's be fair; they're both pretty obscure. Yeah, but yeah, this is what we like to do here. We will find films that have been lost to time because we are trying to talk about all of the spy films ever made and see if they make the knock list. That's our mission, and that's what we're here to do. It's a whole new one hundred. So, Cam, what are we talking about? We are talking about 1945's Confidential Agent, an adaptation of the Graham Greene novel of the same name. Conf- it's actually our second Graham Greene now, I think, with Ministry of Fear. Yeah, I, th- I th- there might have been, I feel like there might have been another one that maybe he did some script work on or something, but yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I remember enjoying Ministry of Fear, mm-hmm. although that was a Fritz Lang film, so that's kind of implied. I do quite like Fritz Lang from what I've seen. Um, I will say, Confidential Agent, like as a title, really feels like a an eighties sort of jazzy song, or like you know, like a lounge song, you know, like smooth operator, <laughs> Confidential <laughs> Agent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have come across just like the last maybe couple of weeks, I've just been adding a bunch of movies to our master list to cover that I've stumbled across uh, largely on YouTube because I often watch old classic movies on YouTube and mm. things will pop up and I'll be like, oh, what? I'll look it up on you know IMDb and be like, oh, this counts and I'll add it. There's a lot that use variations on this title. So like um, Espionage Agent, Secret Agent. There's all these movies that work in a word, International Agent, things like that. I think that's just to make it obvious for the... The people that are buying tickets at the, the, the box office in front of the uh, Nickelodeon. Yeah, because we had like British Agent. Now we've got Confidential Agent. We're going to have a lot of blank agent movies, I think, when this podcast is uh, said and done. Absolutely. I mean, and, and yeah, we are always trying to find new films. I was debating with you just the other day about a Hulk Hogan spy film that I've stumbled across that I'm, uh, I'm pushing to see if we can talk about. But Cam reckons it is a direct to video from the 90s. I think it may have had a theatrical release. The research is ongoing. I guarantee that was not a theatrical release. I mean, not in at least North America. I don't know, like <laughs> maybe on your side, but I would suspect if there was a Hulk Hogan TV movie or a straight to video movie, and I mean VHS, not DVD, uh, it would not have been a theatrical thing. Well, I'll put the earnest on you all out there, our secret agents in the world. The film is called Secret Agent Club playing off of that agent theme, starring Hulk Hogan from 1996. Your mission, folks, should you choose to accept it, is to find out if that had a theatrical release and let us know. And screening it in someone's backyard on a projector does not count. (laughs) It it counts for me, damn it. (laughs) But um, back to Confidential Agent. Now, of course, I've never heard of this. I don't think you'd ever had any experience with this before. No, familiar with, uh, you know, a lot of the actors, but no, I had never heard of Confidential Agent. Well, as this is new to us both, let's jump in with the letterbox.com synopsis. And this one is a very, very short. That is so often the case for these older movies. 
and I, I'm never quite sure why. I would imagine these are user submitted, I think, because some of them are like really like mangled and then some of them are really long. And it's almost like the people who feel compelled to write the synopses for these older movies are just like, they barely have the energy. They are just like falling apart at the keyboard, weak, losing energy, can only write seven words to sum up movie, and they're done. Are you saying that they were alive when this film came out? <laughs> well, I was. I mean, I saw it uh, several times on my 50th birthday. <laughs> you were still a spry young man when this was it. This is kicking around. <laughs> That's right. Uh, um, well, here you go. Confidential agent. You'll see the screen cook when the lover meets the look. Oh, I love that. That's great. You can explain that to me in a minute. There's one more line. During the Spanish Civil War, an agent on a mission to purchase coal meets with murder and counter spies. Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, with these old ones, they tend to go very generic. And I think it's because the people maybe haven't uh, actually watched the movies. They've like looked at the IMDb synopsis or something and just kind of copied something. Does that mean that somewhere along the line we're going to stumble upon a letterbox.com synopsis that has a user-submitted IMDb synopsis that's incorrect? And it's, it's got a synopsis of a completely different film. Possibly, yeah. I'm looking forward to that day. I mean, I don't... There is a movie... I don't remember what it was. It was an old movie that I watched some time ago. I don't think it was a spy thing. But I remember going to Letterboxd and reading the synopsis halfway through the movie because I was so confused because I'd read that in advance and it did not match the movie at all. I'm quite looking forward to stumbling upon this. Maybe we should look at actually updating some of these films. I feel like we have a, a, a small responsibility for some of these films because, frankly, if I type in Confidential Agent into Spotify podcasts, <laughs> I think we might be the only people talking about it, Cam. Which is all well and good for the odd person out there looking for a Confidential Agent podcast. Hey, here we are. Welcome. Hey, hello, everyone. This is what we do here. <laughs> Please stay. Please. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so lonely. Um yeah, so maybe we should look at updating these. But to be fair, you seem quite smitten with that sort of tagline, the lover yeah. meets the look. Now, could you explain that? Okay, so the lover is referring to actor Charles Boyer. Um, he was a French actor and was very much known as sort of this romantic lead in that era. He was in movies like Love Affair, I think most famously Love Affair, which was you know remade a couple times. I believe An Affair to Remember was a remake of that as well as... I think they did a love affair maybe in the 90s that didn't do very well. But he was always seen as this great romantic lead. You know, the French, the language of love and all that sort of thing, right? So that was kind of what he was. And Lauren Bacall, this was her second film, but she made a huge impact in her first film, which was To Have and To Have Not, which is sort of a World War II drama slash romance, where she was just like the epitome of like cool and just kind of seductive. And that was a Humphrey Bogart film. And uh, she made a huge, huge impact. It was basically a star right out of her first film. So it was kind of like, you know, the international lover and the woman with the look. Which which, which are we? Uh, the lover or the look? Um, well, I feel like you have to get the, the lover one because, like, people say a lot kinder things about the British accent than the Canadian accent. No one's like, oh, those hot Canadian accents. <laughs> What what Cam's really doing there is is saying I have a face for radio. <laughs> oh, are you saying that about Charles Boyer? That's cold. Well, you're comparing yourself to uh, to Lauren Bacall here, so you you said it, mate, not me. Lauren Bacam. Let's not do that again. <laughs> I, I've I've banned all rhyming since your uh, subspace transmissions partner Tyler Orton joined us on the show, so we are no <laughs> not allowed to have poems on here anymore. I apologize. <laughs> so you should. Um, but with these old films, sometimes they're hit and miss. But have you got anything on how Confidential Agent came to be? Yeah, I actually do. So this was based, as I said, on a Graham Greene uh, novel that was published in 1939. And he was an English uh, writer, wrote a lot of spy novels. And um, he wrote this, uh, this novel, Confidential Agent, in six weeks. And he hated it. He thought it was just garbage, but critics disagreed. They loved it, and it became a bestseller and was just very popular. And so they decided to adapt it. It was snapped up, and they uh, writer-producer Robert Buckner 
was the man who tackled this one. He'd gotten his break in the late 30s with a movie called Gold is Where You Find It, starring George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and Claude Rains, Spy Hard's favorite, Claude Rains. Mm -hmm. And then basically after that, he was just off and running. One of these guys that had, you know, a career that just spanned across several decades in Hollywood, and he wrote movies like the Errol Flynn Western Dodge City, which is really good. He wrote Espionage Agent. Espionage Agent. Right. I'm seeing a trend here of agents. Uh huh. He also wrote uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, which is one of the big classic American musicals of that era with um, James Cagney. And it was your uh, ICQ handle back in the day. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, this was a follow up to a movie called Desert Song he made. And um, he went on to like kind of like trail off into TV. He did like Disney stuff later in his career. He did, I think, his last real notable. Uh, credit was he wrote the Elvis film Love Me Tender, and then it was kind of into yeah TV and Disney fare. Um, but uh, and also one of his later films was 1966's uh, Return of the Gunfighter, a western with Robert Taylor. I've never seen it, never really heard of it. But that's his final kind of theatrical film, and then he retires in 1970. Now the director they bring in Herman Shumlin, who I was not familiar with at all when I saw the name initially. Um, he was actually a incredibly prolific Broadway theater director and producer, like incredibly. Started in the late 20s with a run of the play Celebrity and ran right into the mid-70s, wrapping up his Broadway career with an a adaptation of um, Shakespeare's As You Like It. Like that is what this guy is known for. He was a massive Broadway um, director and producer. We've had a couple of spy films that have been made uh, by sort of Broadway and uh, West End. Well, like they've written them. We had Ben Power, who who wrote uh, Munich, Edge of War. And I'm forgetting the chap's name who we had on the show who wrote Bridge of Spies. Matt Charmin. And you can also look not just as a you know writer, but like as a director, um, Sam Mendes doing two Bond films. He's a huge theater guy. Of course, he worked with Ben Power. Um, on the Layman trilogy, which just won a bunch of Tony Awards, I believe. Yeah, both Mendes and Power won Tonys for that. So congratulations to former guest um, Ben Power. And future guest Sam Mendes. <laughs> if he'll ever answer our calls. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue. Yes. So um, Shumlin had directed a movie in 1943 called Watch on the Rhine. And he had directed actually a play um called watch on the rhine in 1941 on broadway um and so he was basically adapting that play for the screen and it was about an anti-fascist uh, german engineer in the u.s who had spent 17 years in europe and they encounter a romanian count who is going to report to the german embassy that this german engineer is anti-fascist so it's kind of like a character drama that plays out in a confined setting i've seen the movie i watched it a handful of months ago um not one of my favorite Best Picture nominees. It was like kind of an Academy darling that year. It won a Best Actor um, Oscar for actor Paul Lucas and was nominated for Picture, Actress in a Supporting Role, and Screenplay. It's one that hasn't aged particularly well. It's a little creaky, but I will say the Paul Lucas performance genuinely is astonishing. So it's at least interesting for that. But this was his only other film. He was following up Watch on the Rhine and just confidential agent and then he went back to broadway and never did another hollywood movie i think we've learned from our experiences from interviewing people and just doing the research for this show and just watching films all of our life hollywood is not for everyone no no very true and uh, this movie this project was originally developed um, as a vehicle for humphrey bogart and eleanor parker and i wasn't the name eleanor parker didn't jump immediately to mind she is best known, I think, as the Baroness in Sound of Music. Um, oh. the Yeah, the Christopher Plummer initial love interest before Julie Andrews comes along. Hmm. Okay. I, I vaguely remember her, at least. Yeah. And it's interesting that, like, Humphrey Bogart was seen as a potential lead for this project, given that just the year before, him and Bacall had really exploded together into fireworks doing To Have and To Have Not. Well, maybe that was just a case that they didn't want to repeat themselves. They weren't going to pair him with her. They were going to pair him with uh, Parker. Like, it's just interesting that they 
basically whoever was going to star in Confidential Agent, they were going to be a star of to have and to have not. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. I understand. Yeah, that's a bit strange. And Lauren Bacall, we kind of mentioned her up front. This was her coming off a huge debut. Your lookalike. That's right. Lauren Bacam. It was like the birth of a new icon in Hollywood. And this is, you know, the days of contract players. And so they were very much looking at her as being, you know, one of the big names in their stable of actors. And uh, this was not a movie she wanted to do. She didn't think the role was right for her. She apparently begged them not to have to do it, but she couldn't break contract. She was a, you know, young talent starting out. It was only her second film. She had a, a line where she said, to cast me as an aristocratic English girl was more than a stretch. It was dementia. Okay. I mean, we may well get into her performance, I think, in the, in the review. It, is, uh, it might be worth just explaining for people who aren't too familiar with the Hollywood system back in the day of people being under contract. Mm. I mean, nowadays you see you know, Scarlett Johansson signed on for the latest blah, film, blank, insert whatever you'd like. Whereas, to my knowledge, back in the day, you, like, Warner Brothers had a list of actors they used for their films and they would just swap the male and female leads around and just make things from that. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, like they were in the business of building stars. So if you look at like MGM, they had Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. So they were always trying to find ways to create projects to utilize their biggest stars as a way of drawing in audiences. Because in those days, audiences were very responsive to the lead actors. Like they really were, you know, interested in stars as opposed to now we're more based on, you know, IP, um, properties, you know, we love like, you know, Marvel. Star Wars, things like that. But in those days, the whole selling point was stars. If you look at posters of that era, they are frequently talking about the actors. Like you mentioned, you know, the tagline for this movie. They're talking about the actors, not the characters. It's selling icons. Well, it just takes me back to um, My Favorite Spy. Yeah. That's not a good film, but that poster was Bob Hope in My Favorite Spy. It was all about Bob Hope in My Favorite Spy. Yeah. And I think they had a line as well, like acknowledging Hedy Lamar as being like an icon versus talking about who the character was. Mm. So, yeah, I totally buy that. I, I'm, I'm still not sure I trust anyone who goes to a theater to watch a Bob Hope film, but <laughs> many people did in those days. And yeah, the actors would be under contract. Occasionally they get loaned out to other studios. So sometimes you'll see, you know, an actor who's under contract to a studio appear in another project in another studio but it, it was often kind of back and forth trading these actors were under very ironclad contracts with their studios and it caused a lot of uh, unhappiness within the acting community often well that actually like links into a book i read last year by helen o'hara uh, who works for empire magazine and also previous guest on the show uh, she wrote a book called women versus hollywood the fall and rise of women in film and that sort of taught me all i needed to know about this type of how how studios used to work i had no idea until i read that book i just assumed people were actors they were independent you know contracted people just you would pay for an actor to do a film but like no they were under contract for x amount of films yeah yeah interesting system i'm glad they got rid of it because it like like this she didn't want to do the film yes and it opened her up to probably among the worst reviews of her career the uh movie was hugely targeted for her appear uh, for her performance um it was not a success at the box office and the reviews were just so bad so brutal that um the studio ended up actually re-editing the movie she had coming out the next year called the big sleep to try to build up her role to kind of salvage their star. They were so concerned about the blowback from this movie. And The Big Sleep is now a classic. It's an amazing movie, and she's amazing in it. But it was very clear that they were like, we need to try to like salvage our investment. Like This actress has just gotten just slammed with terrible reviews. How do we make her look great in the next movie? What was the critic's main problem, or is that worth leaving until we talk about the film? Well, I have actually a quote from the New York Times review... Um, it has some language you would not really write into a review nowadays, but I'll read it out. It's from Bosley Crowther, who is one of the most influential critics in that particular era. Here's the quote. He says, Miss Bacall starts out brusque and surly, obtuse and emotionally cold, and she ends up that way, with nary a flicker of responsiveness or give in between. 
Her appearance is far from attractive, and her voice is monotonous and dull, with no more English on it than is on a badly shot billiard ball. The noise she makes in this picture is that of a bubble going poof. I, I got that and maybe agree with some of it. I don't really get the billiard ball joke. I don't get that either, but you'd see, though, like in a review back then, they would target how people looked in a movie. Uh, you wouldn't do that nowadays. Um, but, like, it just shows, like, how savage the reviews are. Because there was a lot like this, but New York Times was obviously one of the most influential. So imagine being, I think she was 20 at the time. Imagine being a 20-year-old actress reading that review. I'm not sure, Cam. The cast of Cats really got raked over the coals for how they looked in that film. But not about their specific appearance as human beings. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of buttholes. Yeah, but that's not, like, it's, they're talking about their CG characters, not about how they physically look as individuals. Cam running to defense of Cats. Okay. I'm not. I mean, that movie got savaged, but like, I think there's a difference between uh, critiquing a CG character versus a uh, <laughs> flesh and blood human. There is. I'm just being annoying. Sure, sure. Um, your specialty. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you set All right. that one up. Yeah, you set yeah. that one up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what kind of podcast we're in for this week, folks. So, like, when I was doing the research on this movie, it really was circling around the Lauren Bacall performance. Like, it just feels like that overtook the entire narrative of the movie at the time. So, um, yeah, I mean, boy, it must have been a learning lesson for her. Like, just talking about, like, opening, like, at top of the world, falling real far, and then climbing back up. I think after that, you'd have a real um, wise approach to, the sh to show business because you've experienced the highs and the lows. Well, it's a real shame because if she didn't want to do the film and then she's getting savaged by the critics for her performance, you can either go one of two ways. Either she didn't put her all into the performance or it was just a no-win scenario that she wouldn't have been good even if she did try. So it's almost unfair. But then I imagine I imagine the reviewers didn't know she didn't want to do the film and that just all came out in the wash afterwards. My suspicion is the fact they felt so compelled to boost up her role in uh, The Big Sleep and to really showcase her talent indicates they realized they made a mistake with miscasting as well. Fair enough. Well, at least they corrected course. That's right. And she's had a, or did have a very long and luminous career. So Lauren Bacall, you know, hats off to you. You definitely were one of the great stars of your era. Uh, the movie, as I said, was not a box office success. Could not find actual numbers because it gets very difficult, especially when you're, I find, dealing with the war period because they have more important things to do than to track actual box office numbers in 1945. Well, it says confidential on, on the label, Cam. It's true. It's true. And the top three for this year, number one was The Bells of St. Mary's, which was a sequel to Going My Way, the Bing Crosby film. Second place, we've talked about it before, Scott. Not on the show. But this is, I think, one of your favorite movies to land on a top three. And we tackled 1945, I think, with uh, The House on 92nd Street. This, at number two, was Mom and Dad. It's the venereal disease movie. <laughs> oh, my God. It's back. Gonorrhea for everyone. Yay. For those who didn't hear that episode, and how dare you not listen to the House on 92nd Street episode, but um, the synopsis for Mom and Dad when a high school girl gets pregnant and her boyfriend dies, the sex ed teacher shows her a film about childbirth and the dangers of venereal disease. And this was the second biggest box office of that year. It just, you just got to think about, like, people are tired from the war. The war ends halfway through the year, more or less, but I'm not sure on release dates, but there's got to be some fatigue either way. And they're like, hey, hey, Billy, do you know what we should do this weekend? Mm-hmm. We should go to the theater. Hmm. And then go see a film about venereal disease. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. Did that happen? Yes, it's in the facts. People did this, and they went in droves. Now, if this movie's on YouTube, would you watch it? 100%. <laughs> we'll have to check afterwards. Maybe that's a uh, agents in the field. <laughs> so something's in the field, I'll tell you that much. <sighs> what, what's it called again? Hang on, what's it called again? Mom and Dad. And number three was Leave Her to Heaven, the Gene Tierney sort of prototype for movies like Fatal Attraction and things like, like that later down the road. Leave Her to Heaven is an amazing movie. It's on the Criterion Collection. I recommend 100% checking it out. I can tell you that Mom and Dad 
is on YouTube for free. How long is it? One hour and 37 minutes. Oh, the 37 minutes you like, there was a bit of a hang there because you said one hour and I was like, sold. 37 minutes. Hmm, maybe. Interestingly enough, if you look at the title, I wonder if this is like an edited version because the poster that's attached to the video, the, the top tagline says, Bold, vital, two hours and two minutes of blazing truth. Well, according to IMDb, it's an hour 37 minutes. So, I don't know. They're just lying in their marketing. Maybe maybe there's like an intermission or something. That they're counting as two hours. <laughs> maybe halftime show. They hand out pamphlets <laughs> about your, your nearest uh, like clinic. Maybe. Who knows? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure I want to, but I think I might anyway. Anyway, that's enough venereal disease. Uh, we should be keeping that confidential. Yeah. And just uh, the final note on this one. Graham Greene said he liked this the best of any of his filmed works. So that's interesting because he clearly didn't like you know, his work on the book when he wrote it, but was very happy with the adaptation. And I mean, I don't know, like we tackled Ministry of Fear and he also wrote The Third Man. Um, I don't know, Third Man's pretty good. <laughs> Eat that, Fritz Lang, who needs you? Yeah, I think that's weird. And Carol Reed did, uh, did The Third Man and that's like one of the all-time classics. So, um, well, there you have it. Well, you, you, like Alan Moore hates almost all of his adaptations of his work. And yet I would say the Watchmen film is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And actually Stephen King doesn't like The Shining. So, you know. Yeah, also weird. Fair enough. People have a... When you create something, you have an image in your head of what you want it to look like. When I envisioned Spy Hards, I was not talking about venereal disease. Right. I mean, we did not expect that Mom and Dad would not only be a movie we would talk about... But also a movie we were like spending time looking up on YouTube to see if we could watch it in our off hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't wait to watch dinner this evening, and then see pictures of venereal diseases. It it, it sounded great. I think I will try to watch it as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, Cam, you give me the impression of a soft man, and so I think it might be time to talk about this film. What do you reckon, Confidential Agent? You a fan? This is an odd one. Um, right out of the gate, it kind of threw me because, you know, when you think of a confidential agent movie coming out in 1945, you're immediately like, oh, of course, World War II. And then it's all centered around the Spanish Civil War. And I was like, whoa, did not see that coming. This movie, I like a lot of elements of it. I found, like... It tackled the Spanish Civil War in a way that it was easy to understand for me, uh, as opposed to, say, like British Agent, where we were a little bit confused um, in just how much it threw you into Russian Revolution, assuming you knew all of the details, especially like 90 years later or whatever it is. Um, this one, I, I thought it did a decent job in getting across sort of the points of view of the characters, um, kind of establishing the stakes of the movie. I liked a lot of the supporting cast in this movie and like the world that it inhabits, I thought was interesting. But at the same time, I found it kind of thin in the storytelling realm. Like, I kind of like that, you know, I'm going to go back to British Agent. Like, I liked how that movie kept me on my toes and I was constantly trying to figure out where it was going to go. Whereas this one, it felt kind of rudimentary where it's like well you know there's papers oh where'd the papers go okay i found the papers oh they disappeared again where's the papers those sorts of elements just felt a little too thin for a movie that's two hours and like a lot of the ones we ta tackle that are older tend to be like that 90 minute mark 100 minutes and they they have a better sense of pace i found this one a little lurchy in that regard but like what kept kind of pulling me back was the supporting cast the villains in particular i thought were fantastic um, so like, it's one that I was very mixed on. I thought like the central, um, you know, the two actors, Lauren Bacall is wildly miscast. If you told me that the character was American, I would have bought it. I would have been like, yeah, sure. I, I didn't think she, you know, I thought she was genuinely American until someone explained that she's meant to be a, a British heiress. Yeah. So that's weird. But like, um, there's a lot of actually casting actors as, uh, nationalities. They are not Charles Boyer is very french he is not spanish it's uh it's, it's in my dislike column is uh <laughs> yeah he's very much french in this film and he's meant to be spanish and that's not how they sound in spain yeah so like in terms of like your leads like 
they were fine. I've seen them both be a lot better elsewhere. And Lauren Bacall obviously wildly miscast, as I said. But, like, it was a movie of, like, pieces where I would admire bits of it. But I just found, like, by the end, I was more than done with Confidential Agent. It's hard not to agree with you. I think I may have liked it slightly more than you. Mm -hmm. I found the atmosphere of the film to be quite enchanting. Like, there's this foggy moodiness to the film. It's very much a noir in that sense. I mean, I I don't know how anyone drove in the London town they depicted because the fog was so thick, you couldn't see a metre in front of you. And I live in London, and I can say it's a little better these days. Visibility is still not great, but I, I, I attribute that to the war. It makes sense. I think you're right. Bacall was wildly miscast, and I don't think she really gives in a good performance. And the fact that her character throughout the film has no arc whatsoever, she's just cold the entire way through and then magically is in love with him at the end. I don't think that's earned at all. But I like the the sort of secondary characters, and I agree. But I actually have quite a, a bit of a love for Charles Boyer. I think his performance is, well, he's clearly a man of ethics. Um, he's doing what he deems is right for his country. He's part of the uprising, trying to overthrow the the sort of fascist government in Spain at the time. I mean, I don't know much about the Spanish Civil War, so I'm not going to pretend to know for this film. But, you know, he's portrayed as a good guy. So I will I will continue with that thought as if he was a good guy. Um and so, like, his moral fortitude sort of carries me through the film in that sense. Like, his mission fails. That's actually quite refreshing. He fails in his actual mission. Yeah. Uh, to secure the coal that the synopsis mentioned. But he does somewhat get revenge for a, a death of a character that happens later in the film. And, you know, I just found him at this, this just charming, charming man. Like, he's not... Like you think about there's a scene in the film where it's Charles Boyer and, and Lauren Bacall is, is almost sort of offering herself to him and he's talking about his wife that was killed by the spanish government and sort of you'd think if it was james bond in that scene he would have shagged her and left charles boyer is the gentleman till the end and i i think that's that's really nice to see and he just seems like an upstanding bloke that i actually kind of support i watch this usually there's a day between my watches i'll watch it and i'll leave it a day i'll ruminate on it do some research and come back in for a final viewing before the podcast i watched this almost back to back last night and today and the, when i watched it last night i was really drawn into the film i think it's too long i think it it's a bit slow yeah but i think it has a lot of ingredients that really work and i think if there was some tweaks to this film people would still be talking about it today. That's kind of, like, I think, like, I was maybe a little more kind of worn out by the end, but I, I agree with you at the same time. Like, there's enough elements here that it's genuinely interesting to watch. And I think, like, Charles Boyer, like, I did like that gentlemanly spy or agent kind of vibe and the fact that, like, you know, he's talking about how he has lost his wife and child to the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. And that hangs over the character through the movie. And I've seen old movies where that's not the case. They have some sort of trauma. And the second they meet the female lead, boom. You know, the violins are kicking in and they're professing their love for each other. And I like that that kind of hangs over right until the very end. There's even a moment where he's talking to Bacall. And it's about the halfway point in the movie where she kind of has turned on him and said she hates all men. And, you know, get shot and die, she says to him. Um... But then she also confesses she's fallen for Denard, which is his character. And, like, there's this moment of kind of, like, tenderness. And he has a line where he's, he basically is referring to not himself, but just, like, you know, the man she could love, um, you know, potentially. And he says, like, you know, it might be worth it if he had the time. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> the origins of the Die Another Day line has been traced all the way back to 1945. Yeah, so like that, I definitely actually rewound and watched over again. But just like the sense that like it wasn't a instant commitment to the romance. And I think like if they had better cast the person opposite him, it's kind of, you know, this is a lot like Little Drummer Girl with Diane Keaton, where you're just like, this is not the right actor for this role. Yeah. And it's causing problems. And like that's how I felt with Lauren Bacall. Like if you had someone who was actively British, 
you know, actively. I, I'm actively <laughs> British. <laughs> I should have said uh. actually British. Um, then maybe you could have had something a little more there. But it just feels like if she didn't want to do the movie and feels uncomfortable with the material, it's hard to have that connection. So even if, like, you're kind of starting that kind of warmth between the two, it didn't really work for me. But, like, I could buy into where he was coming from and i think he carries you through that through that whole story plus the movie we have the same problem every week with you to be fair you're never quite comfortable with it that's very true yeah we make it do with with my charm yeah i find like um charles boyer he's an actor as i said known for all these romantic lead roles but like the most impactful thing i ever saw him in was the movie gaslight which is actually where the term gaslighting came from. Mm -hmm. And it was a remake, because there's actually an earlier version that's not as well remembered. But the remake is him with Ingrid Bergman, where he slowly convinces her she's losing her mind. And it's like the most like sinister, evil performance. It's unbelievable. I recommend Gaslight to anyone. But after that movie, you cannot look at Charles Boyer the same way. And so like even now when I watch movies with him... I immediately flicker back to Gaslight, and I'm like, watch out for that guy. Watch out. What a double bill I have for my supper this evening. Mum and Dad followed by Gaslight. <laughs> You're no kidding. Hannah will be asking many questions of me. Um, I'm, and I, I'll, actually, I'm going to bring this up in my likes section, so let's, let's pivot over to likes. I've said I liked um, Denard, uh, Charles Boyer's character, Louis Denard. One thing I liked about him, it's kind of like a sub-like, is his relationship with the character Else, yeah. who is the character he's trying to get revenge for in sort of the, the second half of this film, because she's killed by two of the villains of this film, uh, you know, played by Peter Lorre, returning Spy Hard's uh, actor from The Man Who Knew Too Much, the Hitchcock film, and uh, Katina Paxinu, I believe. If I'm butchering that, I am sorry to the... Uh, the Paxinau, Paxinou family. But there, they, 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 they offer this child. You know, she's meant to be about 13, 14 in this film, and she's basically working and running this hotel. And there's this, like, father-daughter relationship that sort of appears between the two of them. It's actually really sweet and quite delicate, and I really like that. Yeah. You don't see that in films much. Yeah, she's 14, and she's even talking about how, like, uh, you know, the uh, Paxinau character is like beating her on the regular and mm. you're like oh my god and then like um yeah he's like the lead louis denard is going to get her out of there and that scene where like they murder her and throw her out a window was brutal i was actually astonished they got away with that in a 1940s movie i thought they would have um kind of filed the edges down a little bit as opposed to hearing the scream followed by thud yeah an actual like basically they push her out of like a 10th story window and you just hear the the ah uh, yeah and you just think oof that's brutal and the screen that the actress has, has obviously recorded I guess off screen is really horrifying as well I had to turn it down on my second viewing because I had like my back door open and my, my neighbours were out in their garden I didn't want them thinking I oh, was some sort of nefarious activity happening in my house at lunchtime today yeah um, but yeah I the relationship, though, I, I just think was so sweet. And then he just... I mean, this guy doesn't live in England. He's come to England to talk to some, like, coal mogul about getting coal for the revolutionaries in Spain and sort of to upset the fascists that are being run by Germany. And we all know what happens with those fascists in Germany in a couple of years' time from 1937. Um, so that's the connective tissue there. But... He fails in that mission pretty quickly. And then the film turns into this kind of like a revenge story in a way, also whilst working against the coal stuff. Um, and, and just sort of... It, it's interesting that a couple of scenes with Else, and I'm already like... I, I love them two, them two together. And even she's like, I'll do anything for you, governor. I love you. In, in this very Cockney British accent that I just think was quite adorable. Uh, and she actually went on, the actor who plays Els, uh, Wanda Hendrix actually went on to have a very successful career herself. So, I thought, like, maybe the reason this relationship worked so well in the movie, because I agree, like, there's a real humanity to it. Mm. And when she died, look, we've watched a ton of movies on this podcast where characters die tragically. But, like, this one stung. Yeah. And I think it's 
A, because age, you know, it's a very young person, obviously, in this movie. But more than that, it's because that connection, you really buy into it. And, like, this this poor girl, Elsa, is living just, like, a pitiful life. Like, being beaten by this evil innkeeper woman. You're like, you want to see her get out. It's like almost like a Disney movie. You want to see her get out and live an amazing life. And, like, the way that they end that is brutal. Very pessimistic. Um, So, like... It has a real emotional punch to it, and I wonder how much of that is amplified by the fact the, you could argue, core emotional connection of the movie, which is, you know, your lead and Lauren Bacall's character fizzles, so you put that much more weight on that Elsa relationship. That sort of disappointment, there's another word you just used to describe it, but like how he fails in his mission, and it's sort of how it's just very dire in this film, and there's a tragedy to all of this. I, I think that's probably what Graham Greene appreciated that was carried forward into the film, because they could have Holly, Hollywoodized this very easily and made it like he was successful in his mission to interrupt the coal shipments. It's very uh, trade negotiations. It's very Star Wars Episode One. that whole bit was for me. Um, I am the Senate. But yeah, I, I, I quite like that whole... It's, it's got like an Empire Strikes Back another Star Wars connection feel to it, where the bad guys kind of win this film. Yeah. And I, I quite like that. It might be one of our first in- instances where that's happened on the show. Yeah, you have a line at the very end of the movie where he says, you know, one day I know we must win. And that feels very, you know, obviously this movie's coming out in 1945, but it feels very much like it's acknowledging World War II as well. Um, but I, I was like kind of surprised that it didn't give you that victory i mean spy movies are often very ambiguous especially when you deal with more of the serious stuff where there isn't real rousing victories um but you expected him to succeed through his own active role in the story versus like the business agents um or the businessmen just deciding this was a bad bet well if you actually like track his mission and his efforts to complete his mission he fails in all fronts he doesn't secure the coal. The coal goes to the fascists. He then goes for revenge against Elsa's killers. One kills herself. Yeah. The other one dies of a heart attack. He doesn't actually kill anything, or anyone particularly. He is... He's like... Uh, there's always that story about Indiana Jones in, in the temple. Uh, not the temple. Uh, maybe it's Raiders of Lost Ark. But the one where he's like... It doesn't matter if he was in the film or not. The Nazis still would have melted themselves. Yeah, that's Raiders, yeah. Yeah, like it's kind of got that vibe to it where like he everything he tries in this film fails. He even like tries to pull the trigger on Peter Lorre and the gun doesn't even work. Yeah. Like he and maybe that just makes him endearing in that sense. Like he he is putting his life on the line at several points in this film for what is deemed by this film as the greater good. And you and he just keeps failing. Like you you want him to do well and in the end he gets the girl. Spoilers. Sort of, I guess, <laughs> but it it's it's melancholy. Like it, it 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 really doesn't give you anything. No, I guess what it gives you is that he has like drive because there's a point about the halfway point where you know his contacts you know uh, tell him that he's off the off the job, but he still keeps going. It's that motivation to succeed. So I think that's what makes the character compelling versus like actively seeing him achieve things throughout. Because every time he gets turned down, when he goes to that meeting with the coal guys and he's lost his papers which i thought was a little contrived the whole like well i don't have my papers okay but like um the fact that like he just keeps trying like just tirelessly it's almost like a you know the spy version of like john mcclain it's like he's getting beaten up consistently but he just keeps trying he's a force of nature yeah even when he's like standing up at that pro like they're you know they go to the small town to announce that the coal operations are going to be you know firing back up and he, like, decides to protest against this entire mob and try to sway them to his side. Like, that is a desperate man there. Yeah, and I I mean, it's actually one of the things I don't like about the film is that whole end sequence in Manchester. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit a bit corny, and uh, I don't know, like, he's very lucky that other guy decided to speak up, otherwise he probably would have got killed by from rocks to his face from that mob. Yeah, um, yeah, maybe we can talk more about that in the... Yeah, Vegas. but yeah. what about you? Like, some stuff you liked. Yeah, I think these movies... Um, really benefit from memorable villains. Mm-hmm. I thought Katina Paxinow and Peter Lorre were really memorable and really effective in all their scenes. And actually, her in particular playing Mrs. Melendez, um, 
I thought was chilling. Like they give her very severe like makeup and she just seems so in control throughout every scene she's in. Peter Lorre's kind of her assistant who's not the most effective. He's often just standing as kind of a uh, witness to things. And even when like, you know, Boye captures him, we find out he has a bad heart and is going to be dead in like six months and he just wanted some comfort. He's not a guy who's necessarily... um. He's not pursuing nefarious means as much as just, like, trying to take some comfort at the end of his life. Versus, like, her, she seems actively villainous. And I think, like, all of her scenes are, like, genuinely tense. Uh, When she is left alone with Elsa, I was, like, on the edge of my seat because I'm like, this is not going to go well. Um, The scene wit between her and the actress playing Elsa is where she's thrown out the window. I thought was just really, like, top-notch stuff. And then, like... The way she gets her comeuppance, where it's this guy staying at the hotel, um, Mr. Mukaji. Mukaji, yeah. Um, played by um, Dan Seymour, um, who I think the character was supposed to be Indian. He kept acknowledging that, but uh, I don't know. Judging by his I, his logo on IMDb, he's in uh, some sort of garb on, in a Batman episode from the 1960s. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine that was just a bit of a typecasting at that point. Yeah, Dan Seymour. Um, yeah, that <laughs> that name doesn't really uh, <laughs> seem to be the case. But uh, anyways, um, the fact she gets this comeuppance from this kind of kooky guy living in the hotel who's just like, w- like basically eavesdropping and watching everyone at all times the fact that he writes everything down as an account and mails it off with this contact, this friend of his, the fact that she sits there and says, like, you know, I've matched wits with, like, brilliant people and, like, managed to beat them all. And I'm, like, ultimately conquered by a fool. I thought that was just a great finale for that character. It's actually worth mentioning that Dan Seymour was in Casablanca. Is he? Okay, cool. Mm. Uh, yeah, quite the uh, quite the noted actor actually. Glory Alley, uh, Return of the Fly. Oh, that's yeah. He gets around. Yeah. Return of the Fly is not bad. Um, yeah, Casablanca is all right, I guess. Yeah, but that scene where like she realizes she's been sort of done in by the the world's biggest idiot. Although I'm not entirely convinced he is an idiot. Mm-hmm. Maybe he just thinks a bit differently. Um, it is is terrifying because you don't necessarily know how she's poisoned herself or what's going on um and she like realizes her fate but you're right she is absolutely terrifying i actually tip my hat more towards peter lorry actually i think that scene he delivers once he's been captured by um denard where he says about his heart condition and like he's physically on the precipice of a heart attack and he's you feel that peter lorry is throwing himself into that scene i think that's the best most well acted scene in the entire film yeah like i liked peter laurie a lot he's not as like like i think if you're going to talk about an iconic character in the movie i think it's going to lean more towards mrs melendez but peter laurie we've seen movies where he plays just kind of the bad guy we saw it in the man who knew too much right but i like that there was like layers to that character where he wasn't you know, just a out-and-out villain. And I like the scene where, you know, Elsa's murder happens. And, like, his character is basically just, like, his back against a door. He's not a guy of action in this movie. and He's I, like a weasel. Yeah. He's a snivelly little weasel. And if, if we're going to bring out the Urimov Award out of Mothballs, he is winning that award. Yeah, it's hard to argue for anyone else in the movie. So, like, I just thought, like, in terms of villain performances, both of them. Because um, we've talked about movies um, where... The problem was that you didn't have worthy antagonists, and that can make a huge impact on a movie. And here, even if I have issues with like pacing and some of the storytelling, I thought that like those two kept the energy pretty high. Well, you're talking about those two, but this film actually has more than two major villains, and I think that's maybe something that holds it back a little bit because you've also got Victor Franson as Licata, who is like the Spanish official that's been sent out like a counter spy to take down uh, Denard. And you've also got Captain Curry, uh, who is just sort of gallivanting around southern England, getting in everyone's way basically. Yeah. Um he's actually just more of an obstacle than the villain, but he does basically end up with our our boy Denard getting beat up because of this guy. And uh, fake arrested at the end of the film as well. So I, I would list him as a villain. And I think that there's maybe too many people to deal with at times. 
Lakata kind of represents the evil that Boye's character is facing, but there's no dimension to it whatsoever. I don't know anything about this guy. He apparently killed Boye's wife and daughter um, in like kind of this just brief exchange they have early on. But there's nothing to that character, and I would have liked to have had a better sense just who he was, because I think it would make him being beaten at the end or not getting the contract a little more satisfying. Yeah, I, I think he, he's he's very much that sort of two dimensional representative of a government villain. Like he's the, the whoever the Russian villain is in the Bond film. Insert general, blah. Yeah, all of like he's just kind of that bad guy that's there, but has no real dimension to him. Um, Curry is a bit more of a a strange one because he's just sort of a socialite that is a bit of a busybody and uh, you know. He, but he, at least he has some weird character features. Like he carries photos of his dog around with him and has a, as he calls it, a gammy hand. Um, he stands out, at least. Isn't that what you do, though? You walk around and show people photos of your dog? Yeah, I mean, you should see my photo roll on my iPhone. It's literally all Mac. This man was maybe ahead of the curve because people have Instagram accounts now for their pets. Um, and this guy, it was like a pioneer. Uh yeah. Uh well, uh, my dog does have an Instagram account. Uh, I might even share it in the show notes. You never know. You get some greyhound photos for you. But um, I I will just say about your Miss Melendez, uh, Katina Paxinow character. The one hang up I had about her, seeing as she's the topic of discussion, is I feel like she was in a different film. She's very much like the pantomime villain. She is playing to the back of the theater it's it's a memorable performance and you don't forget the scenes that she's in but whereas everything else in this film is very much cool and contemplative and sort of dark and dreary she is very much like a 60s spy film villain where she's just like fighting you could see her in a film with Derek Flint or something I wonder if that's a little bit of a concession to the audience that if you're going to have a movie like this you want at least one villain that people actively are, you know, hating. Whereas, like, the other ones, you know, the Peter Laurie character, there's some shades there. Um, and then the other ones, like the, you know, the Lakata character, you don't know anything about. So it's like, the, I think they wanted at least one character that you could just out and out hate. Well, it's also, you know, of those four villains that we've mentioned, she is the only one where this is personal. Yeah. She has an actual vendetta against our lead and against his friend else um whereas peter laurie he, he said he's dying soon he just wants a bit of cash to have a nice few months before he goes Licata is working for a bad government but he's working for the government much as any spy is he's just hired it's not necessarily uh, personal it's just business and as we mentioned captain curry is just a busybody yeah we interrupt this program to bring you a special report Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, Scott, we're continuing with the Dirty Airy franchise with 1973's Magnum Force. So do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do ya? And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. Um, but yeah, in terms of dislikes, I think we should probably jump on over to Lauren Bacall. Right. You know, you could talk about the accent. Was there one? That was bad. Was there an accent? There was no attempt at being British. Yeah, I didn't think so. I was like straining to hear even like a lilt or anything. It seemed to me she just used her normal voice. But all it takes is one little rewrite to be like, oh yeah, I mean, her father was a, is a British coal magnate, but she grew up in New York. Yeah, totally. Boom, got it. 
American accent, absolutely fine. No problem with it. And and that's not in it. So you question that immediately. I didn't really mind that so much. My problem, and it seems to be the problem with that chap you quoted earlier from the New York Times, she just remains frosty throughout. And now I'm not saying she should have a character change because she meets a man. Far be it from me to say that people should change for their partners. It's more of a case of she's actively pushing away the person she says she has interest in, and by proxy she's pushing us away as an audience. We're not warming up to her and don't really care. If just the genders were swapped, it would be the same thing. It's not a talking about her being a woman. And so I think it's how it's played and how it's written, I think it is more the issue here. If she was written to like be nicer and you know, more helpful. I know these these sound like I'm sort of like talking about her as a woman and it really isn't that case. It's really just how she's written in that sense. She she is actively pushing you away as a viewer and so you find her to be frosty. The thing with Lauren Bacall too is I don't know if they knew this just coming out of that first movie that she'd made, but like her big kind of feature in that era was like she was the cool blonde like unflappable she was fantastic when she started being cast in film noir movies because she just made like a great you know opposite for character for actors like humphrey bogart and stuff like that in uh, the big sleep or um you know various others it just here that doesn't really work um i'm totally cool with her being a little bit disconnected she's like a rich socialite who doesn't have a good relationship with her father is kind of surrounded by phonies and uh, even the guy she's going to potentially marry, you know, he's got another woman he's seeing on the side and she's just like, well, you know what? I may just be settling for this anyway. Like she doesn't, she she's kind of cynical and has given up on love. But at other points in the movie, she's our avatar character. She's the one who's brought into this, into this intrigue. Mm-hmm. You know, there's scenes where like, he goes and shows her like where he was shot at and there was a bullet in the in the wall and she starts like swooning and like actually almost fainting because she's just like so kind of horrified by you know the danger that she's now experiencing and i'm like i don't buy these two things it's like either she's someone who's calm cool and collected and is like okay i understand you know i can help you out or you're writing that character entirely differently right off the get-go. So she makes a more, um, I don't know, more effective avatar character for the audience. I don't, I don't know. Like, Lauren Bacall, it was weird for me watching this because I did the research before I watched it. So I was very aware how people felt about it. But, like, I'm watching the movie going, she's doing what her strengths are, but they're in a movie that doesn't support them. And that's the problem. Well, you look at um, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious comes out literally the year after this film. Yeah. And that stars Ingrid Bergman as a cool, calm, and collected woman who is very unapproachable, very much... If she had said the line, I don't like melodrama, keep this melodrama away from me, in Notorious, you would have bought it. It makes sense for her character. But throughout the film, she warms up to Cary Grant, and by doing so, you know she's also, she's also then put in danger, so you do feel for her. Um, she just becomes warmer, and you want to, as a as a as an audience, you want her to be protected. Whereas in this film, nor do, not that she needs protecting in this film because she's kind of on the side of everything, but she's also not really actively helping. She's just kind of there. I think she organizes his extraction into the film, though that's not particularly spelled out. That felt like a false crisis they were wedging in to try to get one more kind of you know goosing of the audience moment. Yeah. Yeah, but like I, I just think like if you want a character like this, look at Ingrid Bergman a year later. That's your cool, calm, and collected character that that grows with the film. Rose Cullen as a character has no arc in this film. She is as cold as she was at that bar in the third class cabin on that boat at the start as she is on that boat at the end. But she also keeps saying she doesn't like melodrama, but the way they find to kind of develop her character if they do at all, is to use, like, melodramatic moments where she's suddenly, like, professing her love grandly. And you're like, what? Like, this doesn't feel earned. It doesn't feel like it was an organic, you know, journey for the character. It's like they create, like, maybe two big melodramatic moments to try to sell the romance. And I don't buy it. Like, when he said goodbye to her initially, I thought that was actually fitting, that it was kind of this sort of melancholy, 
he saw where she was coming from. She saw where he was coming from. And it was two kind of strangers parting. And I'm like, you know what? That's pretty effective. And then when she showed up on the boat at the end, I was like, I mean, I kind of expected it. There was going to be a happy ending for sure in a 1940s movie. But at the same time, I'm like, this is not earned. I did kind of like the gag, though, where like he's sitting there looking out over the railing and suddenly her voice kicks in. And it sounds like it's a voiceover of him remembering her. And then she walks into frame. I was like, that's pretty clever. I, I, you know what? I'll give this movie points. I don't like this development, but that was pretty clever. I make another couple of comparisons. You look at Faye Dunaway's character in Three Days of the Condor. She falls in love with Robert Redford. Who wouldn't? Yeah. Um, but at some point, she realizes that it's a zero-sum game and you can't win. So he, she lets him ride off into the sunset and inevitably get killed. You don't see it, but I can imagine he doesn't survive much longer after those three days. And she knows that and walks away. And you have that scene kind of in this, but they, they sort of pull the rug under from itself uh, and have, and unite them at the end. Um, the other character I'd like to draw a, a comparison with is, and we mentioned the film earlier, Munich, The Edge of War, that we covered a few months back. You have the wife of uh, the George McKay character, and she doesn't get a lot of screen time in the film. But the screen time she gets, she spends it nagging George McKay's character. But you know that he is dealing with very big stuff because World War Two is 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 in the midst. Of, it's just starting actually at this point. It's like 1938, I think it was set. Um, and you know that, and you can see that, and you're like, hey, let him get on with his job. He's got big things, big fish to fry. And that's that same scenario, that same power dynamic in this film. And I just think it. It, I think it actually just comes back to the writing. Maybe I'm not actually, you know, leveling any of my complaints at um, Lauren Bacall when it comes to what she says. Maybe the, the accent, I think, was a problem. But maybe this is why people have such a problem with the character in terms of the reviews. It's because it's like an obstacle that our hero has to overcome. I bought her performance a little bit when she, you're getting kind of that more cool Lauren Bacall stuff up front where like she's giving him a ride and like the tire pops on their car and she's like, eh, <laughs> just keeps on going. <laughs> she's like, I don't have time to deal with this. Well, that, it's interesting because then she goes and gets drunk and goes for a dance. Like she's, she's sort of self-destructive. I get the feeling at that point. Yeah. But that goes. As soon as they get to London, she loses that fun and interesting element of her character. And just becomes this person who's like, this is, I'm over this. Could we go now? Yeah, you don't really want a character who's entirely disaffected with just like a couple moments of unearned melodrama. Like, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, what about you, other than Lauren Bacall and any dislikes you have? Well, let's maybe just talk about, you know, you referenced the the protest at the end. But like, there's just some like plot mechanics you got to go through to make this happen. And I found like things like him going to the meeting and then not having his papers with them, just various elements like that felt more contrived than like real world kind of espionage storytelling. And when you have him getting up on that, you know, that pulpit to start giving the speech about how the miners need to support, you know, the, uh, the, um, the Republicans in Spain, I'm like, this feels a little bit more pumped up. I liked it when it was a little more gritty and downbeat, almost like a noirish energy. Well, I think they wrote themselves into a corner. And maybe Graham Greene did too. I haven't read the book. But that like that miner standing up for him really doesn't track with where that town would probably be in terms of poverty. Yeah. Because if the mine's been closed, that is their source of income for the town. And they've turned up and said, hey, we're opening the mines 24-7, 365 days a year. You're all going to get lots and lots of money. And they're all like, yay, money. And then one guy's like, actually, no, this is wrong. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I just, it, it feels out of place. And it feels like they're trying to get to an ending really quickly. I agree. Like, it felt unearned. And... There is an aspect of, like, they want a character, I think, to stand up against the fascists among the commoners because, like, again, this movie's being made during World War II. I don't know with release dates whether the war was over at this point, but, like, you want, you know, to have one of the, the you know, the townsfolk stand up for this so the audience is, is on their side to some degree. But, like, it has this kind of trumped-up sense of danger, too, because you got the, the chauffeur character, like, shooting 
at them and missing. He that's all he does in this movie is shoot and miss. Um, it just felt like prolonging the finale, and I was like, okay, at this point we're kind of manufacturing all these kind of crises to keep um, you know the uh, Boye character kind of jumping through hoops, but it didn't like. I don't mind that they're finding new kind of set pieces to give him, but at the same time, they didn't have any real pace or tension to them, and it felt like kind of just like getting to the end. Which I think connects to maybe a bigger dislike that I had that I've sort of previously mentioned, and that is the pace and the length of the film. Yeah. I feel like if you made this story now, it would be 90 minutes. I was genuinely surprised to see a film that came out at this point that was two hours. Most of the ones we've tackled so far have really been around the 90 or 80 minute mark. I mean, it's not unusual to have, you know, two hour movies made in this era, but um, you are right. Like all the ones we've tackled on this show specifically have all been quite short. Yeah, even like the Hitchcocks at this point, maybe Known Tourist is about, I think, close to two hours. It's an hour 45, I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. It, it, and I just think that if... Maybe they're just being faithful to the novel. Maybe that's what it is. And they're trying to get all the major beats in to Graham Greene fans and be like, hey, I read that bit. Hey, I read that bit. Which I get. But, you know, translating a book to a major motion picture is quite an effort. And we've spoken to screenwriters on the show in our Spymaster interviews that have spoken about the difficulties of translating a book and having to remove sections that work in a narrative sense when you're reading something but don't work when you're trying to portray it with actors on a big screen. And I just feel like there's these moments, like you say, of, of melodrama. They pump into the film and like small action beats, like the, the, the shots and stuff that could have been excised. Like You could have this at a, a really cool 90 minutes, and I think it would work a bit better. Did you feel the sense of danger in this movie? I think I felt it when they were sort of traveling around London. It it did have that sort of dark and grimy feel. Yeah. Like I I get like I felt like the walls were closing in sometimes. Some of the shots in the hotel where you know uh, Mrs. Melendez is coming down the stairs and they're hiding in the corner and it, it feels very claustrophobic. Um, that worked for me. Like th- this bit, I know we're sort of sitting around the dislike pile right now, but there's bits that really work in this film. Some of the cinematography I think is actually really cool. There's like a car chase with these cool POV shots they've built into it, which is really nice to see for 1945. And like those shots lined the stairs, reminds me a lot of what you saw in Notorious the next year, actually, with really good, elegant shots of people coming downstairs and things like that. But I think it just is too long. It's like if someone were to come to me and say, you know, which movie has more happen in it um, that's sort of interesting and exciting, Notorious or Confidential Agent? My answer would be Notorious, which mm-hmm. I think just feels like it's set piece after set piece and very involving. And this movie is 15 minutes longer, and it feels like there's less. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. This movie might have just as much, but it because of the pacing and just kind of how stretched out it feels, it feels like kind of diluted because of that. Well, there's a lot of like reusing of sets in this film, which I think must be a budgetary thing. Like They go back to the hotel several times, the... The hotel bar is reused for certain things. I noticed on my second viewing, like it's there's an economy of of, of trying to like get a cheap film through here. So I, I I can forgive them that, but there really aren't moments that I go back to and think about from a visual sense. Whereas Notorious, I, there's lots of moments I think about, like the like the stairs shot, that big panning shot down the stairs to see the Unica key. I will never lose that moment from my memory. I don't know if in a year's time when we're doing a, you know. Uh, like a, a film commentary on Confidential Agent that I will remember anything about it going into it, except for perhaps the characters of like Elsa and Mrs. Melendez. But I couldn't tell you actual moments, just sort of characteristics. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like, I think there's some key characters I'll remember. I don't know that I'll forget the Elsa being thrown out the window scene. Yeah, true. Um, But it feels like it doesn't have as many high impact moments as some of the more memorable entries in this genre have. Even Ministry of Fear, you know, to look at another Graham Greene adaptation, and I don't think he was particularly happy with that adaptation. I'm not going to comment because I haven't read the book in that regard. But, like, um, I thought that movie had far more moments that will stick with me than this did. I always remember the start of the film where he's staring at the clock waiting for his time in, like, house prison to end. Yeah. And, like, the, the mystic with the seance and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that sticks in my mind. And he like there's a there's like guess the weight of the cake. Yep. That that that's all there. That that's still in my mind. And you're right. Elsa being thrown out the window would definitely stick. Um, barring that, I'm not sure. Um, but I I'm probably out of dislikes. Do you have anything else, Cam? Not really. I mean, for me, it really did come down to that just sort of pace and just kind of lack of tension in the storytelling and obviously the performance that didn't work that we talked about. I guess you could also just say, we mentioned up front, but like, there's a lot of weird casting going on with people from various backgrounds playing roles that are do not like fit the characters, you know, with Boye playing Spanish and uh, Bacall playing British, but it goes way down the line. People are all over the place in terms of who's being cast, and it's... It is a common thing in older movies, but I don't feel like it's... I don't feel like I've seen many older movies with this many cases within one film. Even Mr. Mukherjee. Yeah. Played by Dan Seymour, and he's from Chicago. Yeah. Uh, maybe he... Yeah, I, I might look him up. Maybe his family descends from India or, or something that way, and maybe that's why he was sort of typecast at that point. I don't know. Where was um, Peter Laurie supposed to be from? Uh, uh, well, they're both meant to be from Spain. That's what they're I assume. Both meant to be Spanish operatives, but he doesn't sound Spanish. No, but he has been living in England for a while, so maybe he, I, I could buy that he's sort of taken some of the dialect. And plus, actually, let's talk about this funny language this film has. Peter Laurie was like from you know he's born in Austria Hungary, so it's like again they're casting people from all over the place, all these different accents, and being cast in roles that have different accents. It's very bizarre. Yeah, it's strange. And and this film uh, creates a language, which I would imagine is in the book because it feels too like designed and built for it to be just in a, another Hollywood film. Um, Internatio is the name of the language. And they even design like some basic words. And, and the gimmick is that part of his spy message comes from Peter Laurie through his lessons in, in Internatio, which is meant to be the new language of the world. Now, this is actually taken from Esperanto, which is an actual language that did sort of exist until the mid-80s where it disappeared. Because people stopped talking. Um, And that was, again, designed to be the sort of international language that would be easy for everyone to learn and it would eventually be adopted by everyone. It wasn't. (laughs) Um, So I I, I would imagine Graham Greene was reading about Esperanto and then just changed it into his own version. I was baffled by that scene. First off... Uh, Boye gets a card just saying to go to his specimen lesson, and I'm like, "Pardon me." <laughs> like, eh? I, I, I've been to one of those before, and there was a, a latex glove. It didn't end well. <laughs> I was like, "Specimen lesson? What does that mean?" Well, I'm not gonna worry because I'm sure it's gonna make sense when he actually gets to the lesson. And then he gets there, and it's like, "Yeah, speaking this language." And I'm like, "International? What is it? International or something like that?" Internationale. Yeah. And I was like, "Eh, what?" <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really flashed out anymore. Like uh, apparently, you know, the Peter Lorre character of Contreras is using it as a as a cover. He's working undercover. Yeah, um, and that's where he gives these messages to the Spanish spies in London. Uh, that's a cool little cover, I suppose. It's nice to see. It, it's just weird that they went to the extent of making up with all these languages where he could just be teaching French. Yeah, it definitely felt like uh, the sort of decision. Hungarian. Hungarian. Yeah, it felt like the kind of decision that like made sense probably when the book was written probably when the movie came out, but has aged very poorly. I think it's just one of those things that was of the time that is very confusing now. Speaking of aged, not poorly, but aged, the the owner of the Entrenatio Language School Loved him. Is, uh, was great, quirky fellow, yeah. played by Mr. Ian Wolfe. Now, I could not figure out for the life of me, this is just a funny side story, where the hell I know him from. Okay. I recognize him immediately. I did too. And this chap, yeah, this chap has over 300 credits on his IMDb profile. Now, he passed away in 1992, but yeah, 300 plus credits on IMDb is, is you know, nothing to snub your nose at. And so I went and looked after the film was finished, and it turns out he was in, one of his final credits is in a season one episode of Cheers, which I'm actually watching for the first time right now. Oh. And I'm like, huh, that's him. Uh, weird connection there. And then I dug a little deeper. And it turns out he is in one of our favorite TV shows, Cam, Star Trek. Oh, nice. Do you know which episode? I do indeed. He's actually in two episodes. He is first in Bread and Circuses from season two. Mm-hmm. Yep. As Septimus, 
Okay, that is the one where they go to the basically Roman gladiator planet. Yeah. Is that the one that has the kiss? No, that's Plato's stepchildren. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and then he's in All Our Yesterdays as Mr. Atos. Oh, the librarian, like the the ho- like holographic or robot librarian or something. And mm-hmm. uh, that is the penultimate episode of the series. It's actually a really good episode and should have been the finale. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a funny little side story there. And I, I guess we're in sort of the side story slash notes section now. I have a couple, but Cam, do you have any? I did kind of snicker at the scene where they're like beating up Boyer's character and that other car pulls up and is like, "What's what's going on?" And um, and the 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 man's wife is like, "Edward, drive on." He's like, "Yes, dear." And they drive away. That made me laugh. That was pretty funny. Um, kind of an elderly couple. There was another line that I loved, which was, "Drop that gun, you fool! This is London." <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that that is uh, how it's done around here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We just chastise each other if we pull out a weapon. That's right. And also the scene where um, they have the guy who's dead. It's Peter Laurie, and he's on the couch. And then, like, a nosy neighbor comes over, and they're like, oh, this guy just partied way too hard. And, like, just the the actor who played that neighbor I thought was very funny. And that scene, I don't know that it really belonged in this movie. It felt a little almost, like, too comedic. But at the same time, I enjoyed it. It felt a bit Hitchcock, actually. Yeah. Kind of like a, a, a weird side story. But like he comes in and he goes, oh, is, is that man okay? Yeah. And like, oh, he's had a bit too much. Would it be better if he, uh, you know, expelled? Yeah. And like, no, no, no. It's better if he slept it off. Yeah, that was a, that, that got a little chuckle out of me. I did have um, a couple of quick notes. Obviously, I mentioned Ian Wolfe. Uh, do you feel like you've learned anything about the Spanish Civil War? No, not at all. No, me either. But I don't think the film relies on it, which I think is nice. Yeah, you could also argue maybe it's too thin in that it's like simplifying it. But yes, like it made it, I think, much more easy to digest for me just sitting to watch it. I didn't I wasn't sitting there like having to pause to read Wikipedia pages like I had with British Agent. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, because at the start, it gives you like a little cue card about like 1937. What's going on right now? I was like, uh oh. Mm. British agents feel full of those. Like, is this is this heading down south? But uh, no, that was the only one, and it didn't really rely on it. So I don't, I didn't need to watch a twenty minute YouTube video explaining to me what the uh, Spanish Civil War was. Exactly. Fortunately, um, the other question I had was, you know, part of Louis Denard's uh, Charles Boyer's character mission at the start, he gets interrupted at customs in Dover, coming from France. Um, have you ever been stopped at customs? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely a few times coming back from uh, the U.S. into Canada. Um, I had some tense ones. I remember being put into a you know separate room with my friend and being interrogated as to you know where we got those brand new T-shirts we were wearing and things like that. What do you mean where you got those T-shirts you were wearing? What did the T-shirts say that was that bad? Oh, we used to drive across. It was nothing big. It was like we just used to drive across the border and buy like you know, like heavy metal t-shirts and things like that, and then drive back. Going straight to Hot Topic. Pretty much, yeah. That's uh, That was the era back in the early 2000s. And um, yeah, I just remember they would often, probably because they were bored and it was like later at night, and so they would sometimes put the fear into us. My friend actually came up with a good trick, though, um, that we used to go to this um, ice cream place and get ice cream cones. Mm. And when we drove through with ice cream cones, we never once got pulled over. I mean, obviously there was bundles of drugs underneath the seats. Oh, yeah, of but, course, uh, of course. You know me so well. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, why they call you the snowman. That's right. Um, I've had one incident, and it was my first time ever coming to the United States. Um, we'd had a layover coming from England. We had a layover in Phoenix, and we landed in Las Vegas. Jet lagged. It'd been like an eighteen-hour flight day with the layover and stuff, and they took me in a room and they bought out a box of gloves right honestly i was crapping myself at this point i was like this is my first time traveling overseas apart from europe this is not going to end well and the the officer came in he says um it's okay mr hardy it's all fine um we just uh we think you smile too much (laughs) yeah I, I I didn't know how to react. Like my partner at the time was like outside waiting in tears, thinking I was going to get whisked away to some American prison. 
Yeah. Uh, and they end up in like the Sent Anger video for Metallica. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Uh, but no, fortunately, the glove was not used. Um, apparently, I just smile too much, which uh, I have not changed, folks. I still smile. I mean, yeah, it's like when these sort of situations happen at those customs, even though you've done nothing wrong, you're like, I've clearly done things wrong and I'm going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I'm done for everyone. They've caught me. Yep. What are you doing? What? Nothing. Nothing. But they've caught me. Yeah, I remember they asked me like, "So your friend has a really nice jacket, huh? Where do you get it?" And I was like, "I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a clue." <laughs> Why would I know that? Jeez. At least you got interrogated. I just got left in the room. But that that moment where you're sat in that room, yeah, is 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 quite a terrifying moment. I have to admit. Yep, definitely. Well, it looks like you're trying to make love to me, Cam. <laughs> uh, so let's let's talk about the knock list confidential agent is it making it what do you think no it's one like British agent that I would recommend to people who are fans of the genre and want to check out something kind of off the beaten track um, but I don't think it quite holds up strong enough to recommend like when you're talking about notorious that's an easy in for the knock list that movie still plays like gangbusters this one there's a lot you got to kind of overcome. And so interesting elements. People who are fans of Graham Greene should check it out. But yeah, specialists only. Yeah, I, I think this falls into the category of things that we took a lot from that we enjoyed, but it's just not quite good enough. Well, I wouldn't even say it's quite good enough. It's just not good enough at all to be on the knock list. But it's not anywhere near like a bad film. No. I think there's really, it's still quite a lot to enjoy there. And I think there's a reason Graham Greene said it's the best adaptation of his work. I'm not necessarily sure I agree because I haven't seen all of his adaptations, but this is a good one. But then again, I enjoyed Ministry of Fear. Hey, Ministry of Fear was better, though. Yeah, I think so. Um, and that didn't make the knock list, so this one sure isn't. There you go, folks. Two no's, and as such, Confidential Agent is not making the knock list, and the file on the film is closed and marked as classified cam. What on earth are we talking about next week? Yes, we are going back to Bond. Now, Scott, we've covered the Conneries. We've covered the Brosnans. Where are we going to go now? Well, the answer is we are going to tackle 2006's Casino Royale. We are kicking off the Craig era in style. Well, firstly, I'm disappointed you didn't mention Peter Sellers there in that list. True. But I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. The Sellers era was very short. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he barely made it halfway through the movie. <laughs> he was driving off in his Formula 3 hee-hee, so uh, that's what he was up to. But yeah, it's a big old anniversary week next week. James Bond celebrates 60 years on the silver screen. And uh, yeah, we've got a massive lineup of coverage lined up for you. Not only do we have a Casino Royale review, we also have two Spy Master interviews and a bonus Casino Royale review that I'll uh, let you find out more about next week. That's right. It's going to be a huge couple of weeks of James Bond coverage. So there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Casino Royale, the good one, from 2006. And join us next week. If you like what you heard on the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S. But until next week, listeners... Bonadia.